Hello, Colin Chan. Hi, hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome everyone who's joining us, either through Zoom or through Facebook. Welcome to another welcome session webinar. We're going to give a few minutes, a few moments for the room to fill. Hi, Colin. Can you unmute yourself so we can chit chat? Let's do this. Hey, everybody. What's up? What's up? What's up? Hi, everybody. Where's Washington. everybody from? Romania. Nice. Big up. Where's big everybody ups. from? Colin is uh, with us from Canada. Yep. And Sweden, Burbank, Argentina. Hey, what's up? Wow, this is going fast. India, this is Montreal. Hey, San Diego, Augusta, Canada, Portugal, Portland. Nice, nice. Canada, New Zealand, or Toronto. Hey, Toronto. Greetings, greetings. What's up? Awesome. Wow, great. Great to see all you lovely people. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. Welcome, everybody. Nice. I'm your host, Elizabeth Garcia. I'm sorry, I'm going up crazy here with the presentation. Today we have one of our favorite artists, Colin Chan, who's going to show us today how to go from 2D to 3D using the, the process that he's been using to learn 3D on his own, to make the transition less stressful. So if you're somebody interested in learning how to take your 2D game into the 3D world using ZBrush, this is a great webinar for you. This will not be an in-depth look at ZBrush, so please refrain from asking Colin, um, you know, very, very deep ZBrush questions. These are going to, it's going to be an intro course, an intro look at how to take 2D painting into 3D sculpting. It'll be roughly about an hour long. I'm your host, Elizabeth Garcia. Feel free to send me your questions using the Q&A function and I will be fielding those questions and asking Colin anything relevant. Hopefully you're all familiar with Wacom. I hope they are. <laughs> I hope they are. They, they, um, we, will, we will record this session and share it on YouTube and we're also on Facebook for those of you who aren't joining us via Zoom. And if there are any student animators or student uh, character designers, illustrators, uh, ink artists who are interested in joining our student um, contest that we're having called Cartoon Crunch, the deadline is tomorrow. Please submit your portfolios to cartooncrunch at wacom.com. It's a great opportunity for students ready to get a really nice piece of animation work in their portfolio to do so while getting paid and with the help of some amazing pros like Mike Morris and some of his friends. You'll be guided step by step to create a short cartoon with a group of international students like yourself. This is a paid internship or actually not an internship, a paid uh, opportunity. So please take advantage of it. We have more details about it on our social media. Please check it out. And for those of you watching in North America, in Canada, we do have some amazing bundles and promotions uh, courtesy of our friends at Annex Pro. Please take a look at this slide and take advantage of the amazing sales. We have Intos Pro Medium, Intos Pro Large. You can save uh, up to $130. I will go back to this slide at the end of the presentation for those of you who are interested. Again, thank you so much, Colin, for being here with us. For those of you who don't know Colin, I'll let him uh, do a little bit of an intro, but please follow him at Colin Chan everywhere on social media, C-O-L-L-I-N-C-H-A-N. He's wonderful. He's always sharing amazing work. Take it away, Colin. All right. So for all the people that are in here, welcome, welcome. My name is Colin Chan. Just like Liz, I appreciate Liz uh, for that lovely introduction. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say thanks to Annex Pro for, you know, sponsoring this. Big shout out to the whole Wacom team, um, you know, like Liz and Tom, Pete, 
no, Dougie Fresh, moms, all you guys definitely totally helping me out to get this uh, prepared. And today, uh, well, I, before I jump into anything, a little introduction about myself. As you can see what you're seeing in front of me right now, uh, this is my Instagram. I just want to show you guys, uh, I am a professional artist. This is all I do. Um, I've worked in the commercial TV Can world. Can you share your screen, please? Uh, am I not sharing it? Um, I don't oh, think you sorry. are. Sorry. Oh, sorry. My bad. My bad. My bad. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Are we good? Is that better? Yes, now we see okay. it. Thank you. Sorry, guys. My bad. A little technical difficulties because I thought I was already sharing screen. So my bad, guys, but this is live. This is how it goes. So as you can see here, uh, this is my work. Um, I worked in the TV commercial industry as a storyboard artist. I left that, decided to pursue, um, you know, freelancing, doing everything online. And now we're here, right? That's like the, the Coles Note version of everything. And what I want to show you was these are my pieces of artwork. As you can see, like Liz says, I just started using ZBrush and my portfolio, what I'm showing you is a lot of it is uh, 2D uh, work in a sense of drawing and painting. And as you can see right here on this row, these are my first few ZBrush pieces. Um, so what I'm trying to say here and what this whole process is like for me is I wanted to share kind of the, the fundamentals that I've learned in 2D art is really, really easy to transform into 3D art and taking those same ideologies and the stuff that we study and bringing it here onto ZBrush. And the thing I do want to mention is when I first opened up ZBrush, this is how it looks like. And oh, shout out to ZBrush, right? And um, when I first started, it was really intimidating. When I looked at this, I was like, I just want to jump in and start sculpting. So what I'm going to do is give you like a basic tutorial after hours and hours of doing research, trying to find out everything. No one really had like a one, two minute thing to say, hey, this is how it is. So Liz, you just started recently uh, sculpting, right? So what I would like to ask you is when you were sculpting, like how did the clay, the sculpty, the putty, how did it come? Like, was it in a box? Like, was it not in a box? It was in a box and it was okay. just a, a square. It right. Was uh, the shape of the box, yeah. Right. So when you open up ZBrush, Lighthouse to me is that. It's what you get out of a box, okay? So prime example is we'll go to this project here, the pre-existing projects. And if I pick this head one, it pops up. So if I, if I were to say, I'm going to bring this into real world, Liz, this is what you get out of the box, okay? And one thing that I do want to say and talk about, about the, the look of this is it's, it is a face. We all can see that. But when I'm doing 2D art, the, there's a similarity to this. And when I'm drawing and painting, every artist, we all try to get to this level, which is as interesting as it sounds. So after you do a gesture, if you don't know what a gesture is, uh, please let me know and I can talk more about a gesture, but I'm only going to assume that you guys have a basic understanding of what a gesture, box drawings and all that, the fundamentals to taking uh, something that's, you know, three-dimensional and putting it into a two-dimensional space, right? And in order for us to do that, we have to simplify it because the audience or the viewers that are looking at it, they, they don't, like human eyes don't quite comprehend certain things. And, you know, through all time and master and, you know, human creativity, we were able to break down things into forms. And this is what it is uh, in, a, in a nutshell. So when it comes to that, so this would be the best illustration to kind of describe where we're going when you're trying to draw and paint. And then from there, you would start to, you know, sculpt and start to add things. But what I wanted to talk about was planes and, you know, simple planes is going to talk about the, the orbital bone, right? Like when you, when you know about the skull, you know that this is the orbital bone, this is the cheekbone, X, Y, Z, the more information it is, but it starts right here on simplifying, right? So I just wanted to use that to talk about what light boxes and, and how these projects are kind of laid out and using Elizabeth, you know, she's getting into sculpting that, you know, this is where you start out of the box. So if you were to start on here, you would open up Lightbox, and I would always recommend jumping in onto that. Okay. So with that, I'm going to talk now a little bit about, um, once you have your clay that you want to use, we're going to start talking about, you know, you got your two basic thumbnails and your cam view to help you see if I'm rotating, as you can see, 
a sphere is really difficult to tell you're rotating. If the floor wasn't moving, you wouldn't know if you're rotating it or not. Nine times out of 10, I usually remove the floor because it gets annoying when you're sculpting, but you can use the top right hand corner, the, the models that kind of tells you, but usually I'll try to draw a mark just to kind of let me know, okay, now I'm rotating. So when you first jump in, you want to learn how to rotate these, these things. Now for people that are just starting out, all of those are right here on the right hand corner. Uh, frame, when you click on frame, uh, the best way to, to describe that is if you are digitally painting uh, or if you're on any digital application, it's a control zero where if you're zoomed in or if you're zoomed out, you hit control zero, it brings it right back center of your frame of everything. And that's what that is. Then you have the move tool. And when you click on it, you're moving the object from left, right? Because when you start to sculpt, things start moving. It starts kind of like animating in a weird way. All right. And then you have your zoom in. When you click, you go up and you go down. Basically, it's self-explanatory is what I'm saying. And then you have your rotate button right there. Now, I'm using a Wacom 3D pen. And I'm going to get into talking about that a little bit later. But all of the movements, I'm doing it through my, my, my stylus here. And I'm just kind of like moving it around and pushing the buttons and doing it to do. OK? So right after you get that, before anything, like you saw, I was already drawing lines on uh, using the standard brush. So what I always tell people when you're starting to sculpt, what you want to do is you want to draw a line and kind of look at the brush and say, ask yourself, how does, how would this apply to what you're trying to create, right? Does it look like something? Does it feel like something? Can you, can you uh, manipulate it to make it look like something, okay? So this is the standard brush. And the thing about ZBrush, which is like, again, I'm just giving you the bare minimum so that you could just jump in and just start sculpting. Right now, you could just jump in and start sculpting, but you're probably gonna be like, well, how do I carve? How do I smooth and all that? And the basic thing to realize is why you test out these brushes. So with the standard brush, when I draw a line, it is adding clay to the sculpture. If I click and hold Alt, it's digging into the sculpture, okay? So you guys gotta remember to try out the brush and from then you'll know exactly where to kind of go um, with the whole alt, uh, with, with not alt, but the whole kind of yin and yang aspect of the brush. So if it digs, you hit alt, it's going to add, okay? Uh, the other brush I'm gonna be talking about here, and if you guys don't know about the brush options, there's, again, it gets really crazy. Uh, ZBrush gives you so many options. Like if you hit space bar and you click here on the blob, that becomes your brush you literally can click here to the left, there's your brush, or the easiest way is using your keyboard and hitting the word B for brush and all your brushes show up. And the cool part is everything's alphabetically uh, labeled, but it's labeled by the first letter of the brush that you want. So the brush that I'm gonna be talking about next is the damn standard, okay? And this brush, again, I don't know, Liz, if you want to share a little bit about how when you're sculpting, like for me, I use this brush, again, referring it right back to something that I'm comfortable with um, is uh, 2D work, so drawing and painting. So to me, I use this as like my gestural brush. So I'm just laying down marks. And if I had to say real world is like, I'm using a toothpick to kind of uh, etch in what I kind of want to start with and, and all that. Did you start like that, Liz? Like when you started to sculpt, like how did you, how did you start sculpting with your, with your bad self? I mean, I'm still in the process of learning, so very much just, I'm not playing with tools a lot yep. yet. I'm doing okay. a lot of texture, learning to make shapes and using different kinds of, um, just using different kinds of materials, so clay and- Perfect. Uh, but I'm not quite there yet. But you know what, uh, it's, go ahead. You. Yep. I do have some questions for you. Please um, slow down slightly because we're having a hard time following along. You have a lot of energy. Sorry. And two, you're fine. And two, are these brushes that, um, that you uploaded to ZBrush or ZBrush already come with these brushes? So these are all 100% stock brushes. These are literally everything that I'm doing. Like it's like I said, I'm trying to mimic the idea of when you open up something and just go into it. So all of these brushes are exactly what comes with ZBrush. And that's why it's very intimidating when you first open it up and you see all of these, it's kind of like, where do you start, right? So the brushes that I talked about, the very first opening brush of the, uh, the standard brush, that's kind of like the brush that they give you offhand, but you're able right. to change it 
once you go into the brush options, but these are all the brushes that you get stock with the program, okay? Um, the ones that I'm choosing to talk about and show you guys is only like five brushes. Those five brushes is more than enough for any beginner, any advanced, any, any level of sculptor to kind of go in and do, uh, do work in, in ZBrush. Uh, definitely, I would say when you are using the brush, again, always try it out and ask yourself, what can I use? Or like, ask yourself questions that most people would kind of ignore. Like people would just use a brush and use a brush, but really ask yourself, why am I using this brush? Can I also use this brush for something else? All right. And like I said, when I'm using this damn standard brush, imagine it as if it was a toothpick and I'm just kind of like slightly going in and to also go with, you know, what your learning list to kind of tie it all mm -hmm. in together. Um, it kind of coincides with what I was telling you. Um, oops, uh, what I was telling you about trying the brushes out first. So what they're doing with you in, in class is making you try every medium, right? Every kind of texture so that you have a basic understanding of what you're kind of dealing with, how it yields. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm doing right now because I'm taking a very, very intro class. Yes, so yes. Yeah. And, and, that, and I think that's awesome that you are. Um, so the next, so again, so white, right there, like I said, that's the damn standard brush. The next brush that I'm using or going to use is the clip curve, right? And this clip curve brush, brush, as you can see, it tells you, you have to control and shift key. And what this one does is it cuts clay. Okay, that's how I would break it down. So you hold control and shift. And as you can see, when I'm moving around, you can see that one side of the line is dark and the other side is light. So what you wanna do is make sure that the, this is what happens when you cut it wrong, uh, you gotta know which way you're going. So I went from left to right. Now when I go from right to left, the line's on the opposite side. So once again, like I said, you want to pay attention if you're going right to left, up and down, and you gotta pay attention to that shadow line. And wherever that shadow line is, that is what's going to be cut. So if I wanna cut these pieces, I'm cutting them using the clip curve key. Oh, sorry, brush. Okay, okay. And yep, so that's that and for that, go ahead. Colin, uh, they're asking if uh, ZBrush, if it's free, if it's paid, do you know if, the, if it has a free light version? They do. They have a, right now, I believe the version I'm using, the 2021, they don't have a trial version, but there is a 2020 ZBrush that everyone could use. And I believe it's a free 30 day trial. So I would recommend people to try that out because again, uh, like I was speaking to the, the lovely Tom and we were talking about, you know, what he does for a hobby. And one thing that ZBrush for me is more of a hobby compared to what I do, you know, drawing and painting. But the whole point of this webinar and everything that I'm saying is the goal is to never stop learning, right? And finding new ways to kind of push yourself to learn, right? And um, yeah, so I would always recommend people like, hey, if you can go uh, try this trial version, do it, give it a try. If you have a Wacom tablet, you'll see how amazing uh, the two kind of go together like PB and J. Uh, so going back to this, the next brush I want to talk about is clay buildup. So you hit B, then you hit C for clay buildup, and then it's B again, right? And this brush here is like the universal, everyone loves this brush. And the reason why is when you start to look at it, it has more of an organic look. It actually feels good and it actually looked closer to what you would do in real life when it comes to sculpting clay. And from then, like I'm just kind of working it out, just kind of showing you guys the brush. I'm holding down Alt, so that's why it's digging into the clay. It's kind of, and one thing I do have to also mention about the pressure sensitivity of my Wacom stylus goes hand in hand because the harder I push, you can see the deeper I'm digging. Right. And the, the lighter I touch, the lighter they add. So I, I don't Colin, know. Yep. Can you, repeat, can you repeat which command that was? Yep. The, the, the two, when it comes to brushes, it's alt. Alt is the opposite of what the brush naturally does. So okay. right now I'm using clay build up. And as you can see, when I am 
not pushing any keys. Literally, it is adding clay. The opposite button by clicking and holding Alt, it is sculpting in. So again, yin and yang. Okay, so just to kind of give you guys a, a rundown on the brush that I use here. And then the, the last brush that I'm gonna talk about is the move brush. So B, M, move, we're gonna look for it. Ah, oh, it's right there, V. And with this brush, uh, what we're doing here is it literally does exactly what it says. It's moving clay. So this one would be, if I push it forward, you can see I'm pushing the sides in. And if I turn this over this way and I start to pull out, it starts to move the clay. And again, ZBrush is so intuitive. It's, it's, I, I found out that ZBrush first started as a digital painting program. And so, sometimes like right now, I'm, I don't even know what I'm clicking on. And I'm gonna be honest with you, like I'm telling my walk, I'm like, I want to move this and somehow it knows. And somehow when I pull it, you guys can start to see that there's a nose that's coming from this. And that's where I'm talking about ZBrush being very intuitive. Um, the button that I'm changing for your brush sizes, you can either do it up here, but another quick key is S, right? For brush size. And that is what you guys saw there. And what I'm doing now is like, I am just kind of manipulating and pushing the clay around just like you would do with real clay. So that's it for the brushes because I don't want to make it too crazy. I just wanted to show you guys um, the brushes that you guys really need to know when it comes to just kind of jumping into this program. And then from this point, it's literally rotating, trying to find, uh, because you can't do this when you're painting, like you can't be like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn my painting sideways, but you just turn the canvas and you're not really inside the, the canvas in itself. So when you look at the ability of 3D, you do have to kind of tweak your approach and uh, that is one thing I can definitely say. And yeah, so let's go back with the, I wanna teach you guys another thing now. We talked a little bit about the, um, the quick keys for the shortcuts for this and that, um, this and that meaning the brushes, um, and also the alternate with the alt. And I also did mention about the shift and the S for the size. Shift is to smooth. So again, you can smooth it out as you can see. I'm clicking and holding on to shift and I am smoothing out what I started, all right? Or what I sculpted. And that is definitely- Can you, can yep. you show us again how, how you centered an item within the canvas? Uh, center the item on the canvas. There's right here to the right-hand side, there's frame and that just zooms in. But when you're moving, the basic idea is like the move tool. So you can click right here to the right-hand side. It says move and you click and you hold on to it all right, or push, sorry, you can push onto it with the stylus and you can move it wherever it's going. And uh, yeah, that's actually a really good question because like I said, a lot of the time I'm not clicking on that side because Wacom, the Wacom stylus that I'm using actually has those kind of allocated into the buttons that are on this amazing 3D pen. And I do have some questions regarding your setup because I, I see it on the screen, but I'm not sure if that's a 24 or a 32. Which Cintiq are you using, Colin? I'm using the creme de la creme. This is the uh, Cintiq Pro 32. Uh, it is the biggest and the baddest one out there in the world, I guess you would say. Uh, it's definitely, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful machine and uh, it's, it's industry standard and we'll talk about that industry standard if people don't know what that means but I definitely will let you know that uh, when it comes to the Cintiq 32 like I've actually I came from an Intuos I first started on Intuos and then I got into uh, the Cintiq line and then from there I tried the new Wacom One and then from the Wacom One I tried the Mobile Studio and then now I'm on the um, this lovely Cintiq Pro line. So I would definitely talk using, more. Go ahead. You're also using a different pen. You're using the Pro Pen 2. Some people are asking what's, what the difference is between the Wacom pen and uh, the 3D pen. The Wacom you're using, yeah. Yeah, so this is, so I'll get it closer right there. Uh, this pen right here is the 3D pen, okay? And the difference is there's no eraser. This piece I actually bit because I had to figure out if it was metal. It's totally metal. So don't bite it like I did. <laughs> and I had to try it. Uh, but it comes with three buttons. So I have another stylus right here. This is the, the Pro Pen 
to slim. Okay. So this is exactly the same one that comes with the, let me phrase that. When I mean same, I mean, the design is just a lot thinner. That's why it's called slim. But the one that comes with the Cintiq, I'm not using that one because I was actually trying out the slim version just to see how it feels to have something of a size of a pencil, but the same feel of a Wacom Pro Pen 2. So with the Wacom Pro Pen 2, it would be looking like this, but with an eraser at the end like that. But you only get two buttons. This has three buttons. And at first I was like, what, in, what, what, what is three buttons really going to do? And what I've learned, it actually saves you time. So instead of only having two buttons that you can designate of zooming in, pushing and pulling, and I mean, moving, zooming in and rotating, you now have three options to do so. So I have the top one as my zooming, the middle one as to my moving, and my last one is for the rotation. So it's just literally saving me time for moving my arm there or trying to assign a quick key to it or even using the uh, remote, the Wacom remote as well. And, Thank you for showing yeah. your time. Yeah, no, no, I was, <laughs> I had a whole thing that I was going to get into, but we can get into it right now. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, so with all that, like, so at this moment, it's all about sculpting. And um, one thing I forgot to mention that Liz, I'm pretty sure you know about is the mirroring. So you notice that there's two dots um, when I'm sculpting on one side is actually sculpting on the other side. Uh, when you come from a, uh, a 2D world, you usually only have like one. You don't have a mirroring tool. The only time you would mirror is if you're trying to create certain symmetry. And what I've learned uh, from that is that even though nothing is really perfect and symmetric, the, the idea of saving time to kind of make them symmetric, but then kind of going in and adding the imperfections like what I'm doing right now uh, with just without the mirroring tool. Um, yeah, it, it definitely adds a little bit more character to your piece. But it also, again, as you can see, I did one side. I'm like, dang, I should have hit the X button there because it would have just been easier one motion. So it saves time. But at the same time, you kind of do lose the, how would I explain it? The imperfect, perfect is what I would try to say, like the imperfectness of non-symmetry. Is that a setting that you have to choose or is it, is it default that ZBrush will make everything mirror? Uh, it's default, everything is mirrored. At first I was always kind of questioning why, because I always, again, I'm coming from a 2D world where you rarely use mirroring. And what I've learned when you're mirroring, it's just, honestly, it saves time. And it's just, it, it makes more sense to why a lot of the, the masters, when you look at their work, everything just looks super, perfect <laughs> and uh it, there's like no flaws is what i would say and sometimes when you learn about art you you learn that the imperfect the the flaws are what makes things more beautiful so i would definitely say mix them both you know figure out which one works for you and uh and, and then try that out and for those of you asking if you need a cintiq as large as Collins to work on ZBrush, you oh, do not. Yeah, you, you, you do. Yep. Like I was actually like, so we'll get into it now, right? So um, that's, so again, everything with the ZBrush, you, but I just went through is the basics. And one thing that's universal that I didn't talk about was control Z, which is undo. And everyone should know what control Z is. If you come from any uh, background of uh, when it comes to digital, uh, be it, you know, Photoshop, uh, Illustrator, Quell Painter, Clip Studio, any of those, Control Z, and I, even in this program, Control Z is undo. And that's the last when it comes to the quick keyboards. But to answer your question about picking the right Cintiq, picking, do you need a Cintiq? You know, do you need a Wacom? Do you need a on, uh, on what is it? I guess a, a screen display. That's what I meant to say, right? Uh, no, because when you use an Intuos, like I came from an Intuos and I was doing a lot of my storyboarding on an Intuos. And one thing that I can say was, it literally is like the same outcome because Wacom, yes, is a powerful tool, it's amazing. But in the end, if you as the artists are lacking in certain things, such as um, if you don't understand perspective or if something doesn't look right or if your color theory is not correct, that has nothing to do with the Wacom product you have. That's really truly based upon your knowledge and, and what you know. 
And by saying that, I also want to mention that whatever you're sculpting, it coincides with what you're drawing. When we were all learning to draw, um, if you are coming from, again, a traditional digital background, you want to learn about anything and everything. So um, what I mean by that is the more knowledge you have, the easier it is for you to kind of share that information. And I'm gonna give a quick little story and I'm gonna use uh, my homegirl Kristen as an example. And she says she likes gardening, right? And I'm using her as an example because it doesn't have to be art related. This, is, this, this train of thought actually goes with anything ever. And the more knowledge you have, the better it is uh, when it comes to, like I said, sharing that information, teaching people, right, or doing it yourself. So her as a gardener, like, the more information that she gains, what soil to use, what is the perfect uh, season to plant, you know, X, Y, Z, cucumbers, whatever it is, tomatoes, right? Uh, the more knowledge she has, how much water, do I have to use pesticide? The more information she's able to obtain, it's just easier for her to maintain and make her garden as beautiful as she wants. So it's the same idea when it comes to creating art. When you're creating art, like right now I'm sculpting a skull. I've done so many skulls that I literally know the ins and out of what it is and, and, and what goes here or the generalities or how it's supposed to look. And the reason why I, I'm not even sculpting with the reference and the reason why it's looking like a skull is because like I said, I've been practicing, but I also studied the skull or as you can see through my work, um, I've learned a lot about human anatomy and that plays a huge factor into it as well. And uh, yeah, so. Is there, way, is there a way you can have a, a view of your reference within ZBrush? I found out you need a third party app to do that. I can't remember what it was called, but there was like a third party app. I can't remember what it's called. Maybe. Maybe Tom might know, I can't remember, but you can have it right here onto the side. Um, but this is, this is, so this is the thing about when it comes to 3D reference, which I find interesting and fun. Like if you have a skull, right, and it's in a quarter view like this, at least you can use, you can turn your sculpture quarter view and actually follow along. But now there's a flaw to that because if you have different references, your skull is not gonna really add up, if that makes any sense, because it's gonna be made up with like 10 different references. So you wanna try to find a reference that's gonna have all of whatever you're sculpting in all 360 view, if possible. But if you can't, that's where you kind of have to take the artistic uh, integrity to be like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of fluff it up a little bit. I'm gonna change it up a little bit here. I'm gonna do it a little bit here, or I'm gonna add this or, or not add that and uh, all that kind of stuff. So Colin, somebody's giving us a tip here. Um... Yep, hit me up. You can load reference into Lightbox as a texture and then turn it on and off via C key uh, to get away with not using a, a third party app. Oh. But there are, uh, there's something called Pure Ref. Uh, yes, that's the one. <laughs> yes, that's the one. Yes, that's the one. That's the one. That's the one I knew about. Yes. Sorry. Got really excited. Yeah. Yes. But Alistair is saying that you can also upload it into Lightbox and yep. then turn it on and off. Yeah. Okay, that Thank makes sense. So yeah, thank you for that. See, again, I, I'm learning something new, you know, and, and that's, like I said, the goal for this, this webinar is to continue to, to learn, right? And even though I would say that I've mastered enough basic fundamentals to drawing and painting, sculpting is brand new to me. I don't know, you know, every in and out of this or how to approach this, but, you know, ZBrush made it simple for me to be able to kind of transition my thoughts and my creativity onto here, but also using those same fundamental rules of like plane shading and also, um, you know, blind contouring and all that kind of lovely exercises that I dreaded when I was learning. But now when I, I look at this and I'm like, this actually applies to this, which is a little bit crazy to me. But yeah, so again, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to do so. I, I definitely, want to talk to people more if they have any questions about choosing a Wacom because I notice a lot of people always ask me like what Wacom's best for me right and I always tell them it's really based upon what you're trying to to do are you a graphic designer um, are you an illustrator are you a, a sculptor a lot of that plays a factor into it do you edit videos um, are you a colorist 
Um, are you a Photoshopper? Uh, all of those kind of plays into a factor of uh, how you would choose. And, and the number one thing, of course, is what's your budget? And what would you recommend, say, for a student? Uh, somebody, I would go, yep, go ahead, go ahead. Somebody young, maybe experienced in the 2D world, but trying to switch over to 3D, what would you recommend? I would definitely, okay, so again, how big is your budget? But if you're a student, if you get, and, and again, <laughs> if you got student discounts, <laughs> definitely use it okay because when you become an adult there's no more such thing as I'm gonna use a student discount you don't get those anymore boys and girls so if you have a student discount take advantage of it okay but what I would recommend because if you're going to school I would only talk about what I did and I use it in tools so in tools and tools pro even a bamboo um, because you don't you want to be able to and you I would definitely say you don't need something like the XL or the large um, I would keep that for more of like a home, like I would keep that at home and be like, that's what I do. But my traveling from school to home, I would try to get maybe a medium or a small, to be honest with you. Because if you go with a medium and small, you're able to at least kill two birds with one stone where you're like, I'm gonna throw it in the bag. I'm not too worried. It's small. It doesn't take up too much of my space. And I'm just going to go in. But everything, another thing too, that people are kind of, here's a pro tip to help people uh, with the in tools, right? Everyone's always wanting a screen display because they want to draw on it because they feel it's closer to um, the real thing of when you're drawing because you're looking down and you're drawing with the pen. Yeah, that's true. But then at the same time, my analogy to help those who are having problems with an Intuos is when you ride a bicycle or drive a car, do we look at our hands? Do we look at the handlebar? Do we look at the steering wheel? No, we do not. You have to use that mindset when you are using it in tuos and say, I don't need to look at my hands because what I am drawing is on the screen. I need to be looking at on the screen. And I've seen a lot of ZBrush people use um, in tuoses because that pressure sensitivity is, is amazing on those things. Just because it doesn't have a screen doesn't mean it's, it's bad. I, I had one, I was using one for over 10 years. So, and it's still, and it's still trucking. I, can, I guarantee I can dust that off throw it uh throw it on here and it still work and um and that's again i gotta give props to wacom because they really do know how to make like really good products like it's it's gonna last and that's one thing i, I can say so if anyone has any issues with an intuos or a bamboo or anything that is not screen related i would definitely tell you try that that mindset look at it as if i'm riding a bike do I have to look at my steering? I'm uh, not steering. Do I have to look at my handlebars? No, I just got to look at the screen and do work. That's all you have to do. They made it that simple for us. Um, but if you want to screen badly, I'm not going to lie. The Wacom one, totally nice. Like I was a little shocked when I, when I was, I was like, okay, not bad. But it's again, not on the same level as a, as a Cintiq, not Cintiq Pro, but a Cintiq. Um, you know, the pen's a little bit different. The pen's actually closer. And now thinking about it, the Wacom One pen feels exactly like this 3D pen because it doesn't have an eraser, right? It has two buttons and it doesn't have an eraser. Is that a good or bad thing? That depends on you as, as an artist. If you are, because sometimes I don't even like to turn my, my pen around, but sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. So it's not a necessity. It's up to you how you kind of uh, do your thing when it comes to creating. Also, somebody uh, points out that with a tablet, there's also less wrist movement. So, um, uh, so what, for that person that says less, are they saying using a, a in tools is less, um, less wrist movement or more wrist movement? Yeah, he's saying that with a smaller tablet, less, there's less wrist movement and, and it's also more portable. Yes, Obviously. yes, that, that's true. That is true. That is true. Like, because it's a smaller uh, space to draw on. Yeah, you're, you're kind of going from point A to point B. It's true. 100% true. Yes. I was a little confused because like, mm, what do you mean? But no, whoever said that? Yes, that is, that is, that is, that is factual evidence right there. Uh, 100%. I've, also heard, um, I've also heard some people like Dan Catcher, a very good 3D artist. Um, 
he said that he preferred using a tablet because sometimes he needed to get really, really close to the details and having his hand off the yep. screen. Yep. I was just going to, I'm glad that you mentioned that. I was, I was, I was going to say that was one of the, yeah, that's so very, 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 very true. Like that is a very good, uh, very good observation. Uh, I agree a hundred percent with that, that person, because sometimes when you're drawing and you're trying to get in your stylus and your hand does get, get in the way. So I can, I can totally agree with that. Um, one thing that I can say about the, this, this beautiful beast that I'm working on now, it's a little nostalgia for me because when I was uh, light drawing, I was using my shoulder. Most of the time when you draw, you want to draw with your shoulders and not with your wrists because you get more movement. But again, that's on larger scale pieces. Um, so coming back onto this, not only it's beautiful that I don't have to constantly zoom out and, you know, if like, uh, I had a 13 inch Cintiq and, you know, a nine by 12 would look like probably this small on my tablet, uh, when I'm zoomed all the way out. But when you're working, you're, you know, all the way in with this, with this bad boy, um, at least I don't have to do much zooming in or out. It's just straight kind of. Oh, it's nine by 12. It's nine by 12. Colin, is there a way to lock the piece in the center of the screen while working instead of wandering it side to side? Aaron wants to find out. Um, I think there might be to lock a certain place, but again, I've, I honestly haven't dove into playing around and moving it. Like I don't mind it moving around because I'm always moving it, but I believe there most likely should be. I would be shocked if there wasn't. But I personally can tell you that I don't know. And I will be mad enough to admit that I don't know. And for those of you wondering when we'll have another ZBrush webinar going more into depth, actually next week we have one coming up with Queen C. Baden, and he's going to show us um, uh, just a, a more advanced look into ZBrush while uh, Colin Chan covers the basics today. So Yeah, so like I said, yeah, so the basic of what I was trying to say with all of this is I'm not trying to teach you guys the in and outs of this program. What I'm showing you is the proof is in the pudding. Um, I'm never stopping learning. I come from a 2D background and I'm able to sculpt this just off the fly. So, you know, uh, for anyone that wants to try it, don't be afraid. I was terrified when I went here and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Am I able to, even remotely have my work look close to what I have in my head. And one thing I have to give props to ZBrush is that they do make it simple enough. A lot of, a lot of stuff, but once you get the basic of what I just showed you of how do I jump in and just start, because I think that's what everyone wants to do. They want to just jump in and start and there's nothing, uh, nothing stopping them to do that. And I was hoping to kind of go in and, and show that and hopefully I did. And if I didn't, this is the reason why you can always watch the replays. This will be replaying, but we're uploading it on YouTube, guys, for you guys who want to go back and take some notes, learning some basics of ZBrush. And please send me your questions. We have Colin here answering. He's learning as he, so Colin, are you taking a class or are you just learning this on your own? Learning this on my own. <laughs> like I'm learning this on my own. There's maybe YouTube videos. I'll go in if I need to ask a question, but the, the stubborn artist in me is kind of like, I am going to keep bashing my head into this program until it either I bleed or it bleeds. And so far it's bleeding for me. So it's been, it's been decent. So what I want to talk about now, because I'm looking at the time and I didn't want to take up too much of your time. I'm sculpting and talking. Um, you know, hopefully I was able to kind of show you guys instead of talking about you know, how the 2D thing works. I'm only going to assume that people know the fundamentals of like box drawings and gestures and how does that all work out? And as you can see, using certain tools, I'm telling myself it looks like this. So I'm going to create a skull, something that I'm familiar with, something that I know, right? Again, knowledge is key, ladies and gentlemen. The more knowledge you have, the easier it is for you to create. And once you have that knowledge, I would definitely say, you know, apply it. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to kind of quickly talk about is the last part, which is coloring. Okay. And if you go over here to the color side, you can actually change the color 
of the clay that you're sculpting on. So being it that it's a, uh, a skull, I'm gonna to try to get something closer to um, a white, but an off-white. And now this is where I would tell you, ZBrush, if you have any 2D experience of coloring or color theory, then this is just a breeze for you at this moment, okay? So we're gonna say this is done, right? Like I've only spent about maybe close to 40 minutes on this. All right, we all know that it's a skull, looks like a skull. Does it look decent? Sure, money, good. We're now it's time to paint. And uh, the way I'm gonna tell you guys how it starts off is we're gonna turn off the Z add so we can't uh, add any more clay or subtract clay. Uh, turn on the RGB. And then what you're gonna do to the free hand here is you're gonna turn it into color spray. And you go to the alpha and we're gonna give it a little kind of textural-ish spray here. And then I would definitely tell you to pick, now this is where color theory kind of comes in, sorry. Um, wait, right there, okay. Then you go to color, all right? And you gotta make sure you hit fill object. Okay, so at this moment you can choose your, so if you know anything about color theory, it's all about glazing. And one thing about ZBrush here is that they really did not run away from digital painting. And what I mean by that is if you know about color theory, you know, about, you know, certain complementary colors and primary colors and how it all coincides, whatever you try to do is make sure that you try not to get, you know, doo-doo colors in here. So you want to kind of glaze everything. And if you don't know what glazing is, glazing is basically adding light layers of certain colors, like a yellow, and then you can put um, a red on top of that to make an orange. So those are the basic uh, quick rundown of glazing. And what you're gonna try to do is you're gonna try to work up and keep building and keep building and keep building. Um, and with that being said, as you can see, I am adding certain colors and I'm just kind of lightly glazing the spray on top of this. And if anyone has any questions about color theory or anything like that, feel free to let's talk about it. Well, they're mm, asking us about, in addition to colors, can we add textures? Yes, you and can. Do, textures, do the textures wrap into the shapes? Or they yeah. like a sheet yep. or what? They do. So like what I just did here, like the, the, the alpha, these are your textures. Well, no, sorry. Right below it is the texture right here. These are textures. And you can import and all that, and you can add those on here. And it, it, it does, it, it acts like, it's very similar to what you're seeing now. Like it's like a spraying motion, I guess you would say. So you can spray it on and, and slowly kind of work that texture. And I believe with the Wacom tablet, again, you're capable of, you know, the harder you push, like if I push hard on here, you can see the colors kind of changing. And can you upload your own texture? Say that, you know, yeah. I like that I do know. Yeah. yeah, you can. Yes, you can. Um, can you tell us about alphas? Somebody in our chat was wondering if you could explain what alphas are. So from my experience with alphas, they are pretty much, <sighs> that's such a good, that's how would I, how would I medically work do it? So right now I'm using alpha seven and alpha eight. And when you look at them, they would look more close to like aerosol or airbrush, like, um, like the nozzle or the, the way that is going to spray onto your surface. So that's the best way I would talk about alpha. Alpha is very much that of what I just said of like this, like a spray kind of texture-ish look-ish kind of way, like dots. Okay. If that makes I mean, sense. <laughs> I, I think it makes sense. Let us know, Christina if that made sense, or you can elaborate a little more on alphas. I know Christina, she's my Facebook friend, I remember her. <laughs> Hi, uh, Facebook I, friend. So, uh, somebody wants to know, do ZBrush objects, can they be easily exported, let's say to Unreal or Cinema? Do you know that? Okay, so I, you can actually, one thing that's really crazy with this, you could actually have a time lapse. Um, I, did, I did experience that that you can definitely have a time lapse 
uh, all of ZBrush records your movement. So right up here is your undo history and you can actually drag it back and forth. But the basic idea is it records that and it kind of turns it into an animation and you can render that out as a, uh, as a movie file. And then you can then import that to your, um, you know, premiere or your final cut and then kind of, you know, add your music and all that kind of stuff to it. So you can do it that way. You can do JPEGs um, and other, other files as well. So you definitely can, can turn, turn your, your artwork into time lapses. Uh, it already does that within the program. So that's very, very cool. Are there any um, hardware requirements? Is ZBrush a really heavy program? Does it work better with PC, Mac? I mean, in terms of a computer, why would you recommend somebody who's using the full version of ZBrush to have? Um, one thing that I've learned, I have a pretty hefty PC. Like it's pretty decent. Um, the spec wise, I would say a mid tier gaming computer would be more than enough. If you have a Mac, you have more than enough to, to, to uh, start using ZBrush. So yeah, if you, if you want more spec wise, like I couldn't tell you what the minimum requirement of ZBrush would be, but from what I've seen people use, like I can tell you for, for my PC, it's a, it's a little higher than a mid tier gaming PC, but you can definitely um, have a mid tier uh, PC, or you can even look at, uh, I would also use, for instance, the mobile studio pro that uh, Wacom has, like, I believe that's a, is it a I seven chip or is it an I five chip? I think it's an I seven chip. That's a Thomas question. I think it's an I seven. Yeah. I think it's an I seven chip and that's more than enough. Cause I've done ZBrush on that. And that was like the bare minimum requirements on that. You can, you can, you can ZBrush on that as well. Oh my God, Colin, I have a question here that I don't even know the answer to. Can ZBrush work on phones? No, wait, oh, wait. I think they, I, okay, so I know ZBrush recently has a new free, oh, wait, I should mention this. They have a ZBrush that's not a full version called the ZBrush Mini. And that's a, and it's like a really stripped down version of ZBrush. And um, that one, I don't know if it's, you're able to do it on a phone. You maybe could, I don't know, but I doubt it. I think ZBrush is only for computers. I don't even think it's out for any Apple devices. Thank you. And Alan Arribas is saying that ZBrush is CPU department program. It doesn't use a GPU. I don't know what that means, but I'm gonna throw it out there because it sounds like you guys know what it means. So a GPU is a graphics card and a CPU is a computer. Uh, it's like the brain of the computer. So instead of using the graphic, he's saying that he uses more of the, the brain of the computer. Awesome. All right. So Seabridge is a CPU dependent program, not there a is. GPU. There Thank it is. you, Alan. And Sebastian is saying that there is an app for Android similar to Seabridge, but not quite Seabridge. Exactly, right? Like there's always, there's always something to that. Like, yeah, that's... Uh, that's valid, I would say. If, uh, if there's other ways of you, like, you know what? Again, going with learning, it, you don't have to use ZBrush to, to, you know, there's other sculpting programs out there. So I would definitely tell people like, yeah, if you can find another way of learning, definitely do so. Uh, don't be afraid to, you know, go outside the box. And, uh, you know, if everyone's doing this one thing, it doesn't necessarily mean like you have to go out and do it. And Colin, uh, do you always start with a skeleton when you're sculpting? Is that a good practice to always start with what's underneath? Um, when it comes to, again, um, when it comes to faces, yes. Because just like I was showing you earlier with the, uh, the project of the face with it just having planes, um, all of that is a simplified version of this. Does that make sense? Um, they just did it where it's like plane. So it would be one plane here, one plane here. One, you know what I mean? Like it's trying to illustrate plane changes. Like this is going to be flat 
and then it's going to move over. And then right here where the uh, orbital bone, can't remember what this bone's called, but there is a divot here. There's a line. And as you can see, it was simplified on the planes for that. So when you were to ask me about knowing the skull, does that help? Yes, because you know what's underneath a face. So that when a shadow is being casted because of uh, a directional change, change of uh, planes, it, it, it coincides with like the lighting changing and all of that. So it's, it's, if I had to break it down this way, we can say it this way, uh, to do your job, right? To do your job well, the more you know what you need to do and how to do it, you're going to be better at it, more efficient, correct? Absolutely. And that is the same analogy I would use for, uh, for art. So if I do portraits and I don't know the human anatomy or like what's underneath it, the muscles, the skulls, uh, X, Y, Z, I will personally tell you that I don't think that my work would look the way that it does. And how I know that is because when I first started, my work didn't look like the way that it does. You know, to quote again, um, Dan Catcher, one of my favorite 3D sculptors, he did uh, mention that he always start with a skeleton because if they're anatomically correct, correct, yep, uh, they're actually more believable and more scary. And uh, <laughs> if you can actually run and, and, and fly, then yep. the design will be so much better. That's that's really good. That is a, a really really in depth look, and I and I agree with it 100. percent So that's the what? basis. Go ahead. Sorry, what's a good resolution to start a sculpture with in ZBrush? Um, Serena wants to know. So again, that I believe is gonna be how, how much your computer can take. Because I personally would, like for, for my, my, my stuff is I'm at the, the high res, I'm not at the low res. And you can see my resolutions at like 128, but I would try to turn it up all the way and then I would be okay with that. I would always try to do it to the highest uh, the highest that you can go because the more resolution it looks, the better, the clarity and um, all of, uh, it just, it's just going to be more helpful for you when you're, when you're sculpting. Okay. So. Is everything done in ZBrush uh, from scratch or can one draw something in Illustrator or Photoshop first and then bringing me into ZBrush and sculpt it somehow and sculpt, um, turn it into a 3D model. Uh, Jeff Swab is asking. I have never seen any person bring a 2D image. And like, if I took my portrait painting and I put it in here, can I like pull it? I've never seen that. And I don't think this program does that. I've never seen that. And I do, I, I will sit here and say this program does, does not, I've never seen that. And I think they're going towards that because for this new ZBrush, uh, 2021, like the fabric stuff that they've recently released, it's closer to what that uh, person was asking. It's like, they already have a lot of these kind of objects kind of already filled up and filled in. And, and it's like a girl wearing a dress. They, you don't even need to know about fabrics and anything to that extent. It just, they already have all of that programmed within ZBrush, which I was really fabricasted when I saw that. Because it took me years to learn how to, to how to shade uh, folds, and I'm just sitting here being like, I could have just done it on ZBrush for like two seconds. That would have been way, 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 way better and quicker. But again, knowledge is key. The more knowledge you have, the better it is. So I just wanted to say, like, that's the basis of of painting on this. It takes it's really time consuming. This is closer to. So if anyone wants to say, what does it feel like if you've ever used an airbrush? digital airbrush or airbrush, this is exactly what it feels like when you're painting in ZBrush. Uh, it's a very slow and tedious process, but again, um, knowing your color theory and knowing how to layer and how to glaze is what's going to save you um, when it comes to sculpting. I'm sorry, not sculpting, when it comes to spraying yeah, and painting on here. Can multiple sculptures be joined into a single image? For example, yes. a bird head, wings, yeah, feet? Yeah, yeah, that they can do that, yes. I've seen it. Oh. I haven't done it, but I've seen it. Also, somebody was asking if ZBrush has layers. 
Uh, we- not that I know of. Like, it's not the way that we think. I think there's layers to the extent of when you're coloring, but when you're sculpting, there's, uh, I can't say that too, because you can mesh, you can mesh multiple objects into one. So I, but there's nothing that I can see on the side that's like layer one, layer two, layer three. It's not like that. I don't think they, they list it like that. Now, let's say, Colin, that you were ready to start adding a face to this skeleton. Yeah. How do you add that? I would probably just sculpt it. I would do it the long way. As, as stubborn as I would be, that's how I would do it. Is, I, I know that's probably not what people want to hear because they probably want to take it where you open up another file, you mesh it in, and then you, you continue from there. But to me, I feel... Uh, it's the same idea of when I, when I digitally paint, a lot of people use multiple layers, right? I try to keep my minimum two to one. I try to keep it as traditional as possible. Um, that could be my stubbornness, but the way I see it is, I feel I have more control over that and less stress about, oh, was that on this layer? Or was that on that layer? Oh, wait, hold on, wait this layer is on top of that layer now. Now that's not what I wanted. And I've, I've, I've worked with layers in that aspect. And I think with ZBrush, because I already come from that world of using layers, I think if I were to use layers on here, I think it would only strictly be for painting. It, uh, if you're asking me, would I put another layer? If I want to put like a chicken panda on the back, or if I wanted to put Liz's amazing sculpture of the eye right back here, I don't think I would be like, Liz, let me take your sculpture, you know, scan it and then throw it in. I'd probably be like, use your, your eye, re- your eye as a reference. And then I would just literally sculpt in an eye. That's how I would do it. Regarding um, anatomy, skull, using this skull example, would you yeah. recommend learning to draw anatomy better in 2D or 3D first? Yes. Okay, that's a great question, and I love that because it it's this is what's uh what I've learned from from ZBrush that really is kind of nutty to me. And what I mean by nutty, I mean so right now we are using we are in a 3D program, right? And when you're drawing in 2D, we have to think in 3D, which is what I've come to realize. When you're so if I were to draw a skull in 2D or paint a skull in 2D, most likely you're not gonna do one that's not dynamic. So you would either want a quarter view, just like how the skull is right here, a quarter down view. And what I would then do is I would have a box. And just in case people don't know about how important and how box drawings are like literally fundamental, me and my, uh, my Wacom moms, we created a video tutorial for Wacom and for all of you guys to go check out, it's on my YouTube and Wacom's blog. And literally I go super in depth on a 3D box. So let's, let's take that in, a 3D box in a 2D space. Why am I doing that? Why am I trying to make myself learn how to take a flat image and make it not look flat, right? But instead it's kind of the opposite here because we're in a 3D space and nothing can look flat. So that transition of wanting to learn anatomy, I would definitely really tell you, do it in 2D before you do it in 3D. Because when you're doing it in 2D, you're drawing it like this, side profile, quarter back side, and you're learning every angle possible. And then your mental library is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, that when you finally get to here, like I showed you today, you just jump in and do it. And uh, trying to explain it is just really based on like, I'm trying to find ways that everyone can relate to when it comes to drawing and painting. So um, let's let her, I'm going to ask the audiences, how many people in here um, draw and paint? And if you are a, a fully ZBrush user, like, do you draw and paint? So let me know uh, from the, the answers, how many people draw and paint? Okay, well, people answer that question. Yep. I mean, yeah, we're, I'm going to read into you. A lot of people here saying, yes, Kimberly, they use both. Paint, yep. draw. Perfect. Traditional and d- digital. Yep. So how many people had to do the exercise of blind contouring? 
Does anyone, does everyone in the chat know what blind contouring drawings look like and what, and have you done it? That's pretty much what it is. Yeah, most yeah. people are Most people saying yes. yeah, right? Okay, so check yeah. this out guys. All right, perfect. Let's go with that, right? So this is why, this is the best analogy for everyone to understand ZBrush and sculpting in 3D. So it also coincides with the Intools talk too. So where a blind contour drawing or blind contour exercise is when you are drawing on something. So for instance, you will take a sketchbook, you cover your hands and whatever you're drawing, you can't look at your hand. You have to look at the object that you're drawing and you have to draw it and you're drawing it blind. Okay. And now for the longest time, I guarantee everyone on the chat, they probably hated it because at the end of it, it looked so bad. It didn't look anything like what you, it looked like. You're, if you're drawing a face, you're like, that is a bunch of scribbles, like chicken scratch all over the place. That doesn't even look like, a, I don't even know what the heck that is. I remember in, in, in school when we had to do this in art school, a lot of students would cheat, right? And they would do like, and people, the teacher would be like, how, how can you do such a symmetric face when you're drawing blind? And again, like, you know, if they have that, x-ray vision that's what they try to pull off but it doesn't work off that way but now with blind contouring the concept of that is you have to imagine your pen your brush whatever your drawing uh, utensil is is on the object so I'm going to if you guys can see my hand cam here I'm going to move my hand and I'm going to zoom in so you guys have a better view so the basic idea of a blind contour just in case if you didn't know what it is Liz or moms or anybody else or Chris, Kristen doesn't know it I know she doesn't rookie so the best way to describe a blind contour is when you take your pen and you are pretending to put that pen just like this and you're following that line and you're going across the face or the skull and you're slowly going over everything and you're trying to complete that whole entire thing blindly, okay? So we all know for a fact that it's not gonna look like this, but that's the idea. Now, why, why are we doing that? Why are we learning about blind contouring and how does it relate to sculpting? Well, I can tell you, is because when you are using blind contouring, that exercise is supposed to teach your eyes to see across the image and understand the planes, to make you understand that the orbital bone goes up, it comes down, it loops in, it goes in cave because there is an eyeball here, right? It comes on out and it just, it, there's multiple levels of planes, multiple levels of um, angles that something has. And when you are slowly training your eyes, that is how you're doing it. So that actually coincides with ZBrush, which is when I first did it, I was like, this is blind contouring. Because in reality, yes, I'm telling where my stylist is going, but I am literally, when you're sculpting, I am describing the plane that this cheekbone is. I know for a fact that this cheekbone wraps over and in. So I know I have to dig here to build that kind of plane. And I know when I'm sculpting, I'm coming in a reverse C motion all the way across. But when you're sculpting, you have to move this object around and around until you perform it correctly of how, how a cheekbone would look like. So for anyone that's in there, hopefully that literally nails it down because I can't get any more basic of explaining taking such a bad exercise and we and we and we already had and we all had that in our in our brain right like we all had to go through that we're all like what's the point of this that point is it makes your drawings look more three-dimensional because your eyes are now trained to look through the image around the image and now you take that same knowledge in the back of your head and you already have it and your hands are already doing it in zbrush so Hopefully that makes sense. So hopefully you can even use that tip, uh, Liz, because you're starting to sculpt. So while you're doing it, practice some practice training your eyes. Uh, you can do it with a in tools because in reality you're not looking at your hand, and you can again practice that same idea because you're not looking at your hand, you're not looking at what you're drawing, you're just looking at the image and you're kind of like letting your hand go and trying to illustrate it so that when someone looks at it, they go like, oh, that's an eye. And if someone can watch your blind contouring and be like, hey, that's an eye, then you did a good job. Makes sense. Thank you, Khan. That's a, it's a basic that 
a lot of people in our chat were familiar with, some not so much, but we all get the principle. Yeah, so that's, yep. Go, go, go ahead if you want to. No, no, I was, I was just going to say, um, no, I, I appreciate it. And we are about ending the time, but I guess we got to talk about the, uh, the giveaway. I think that's where we're at now, right? Yes. <laughs> we forgot to mention that to everybody, so we apologize. No, no worries. Why don't you tell us about that and how we can participate? Okay, so with the whole point of this um, webinar, like I said, is never stop learning, okay? I was trying to tell you guys, hopefully I was capable of teaching you guys not to be afraid of trying something new and just jumping in and, and, and doing it. So shout out to Annex Pro because they're sponsoring this giveaway and you know, welcome what you guys can win. We're giving away two um, Intuos Pro small creative pen tablets, okay? So for those who are watching, all you guys really need to do is, if you have Instagram, you guys are already halfway winning, uh, tag me and then use the hashtag learn with Colin. So again, hashtag learn, L-E-A-R-N with W-I-T-H, Colin, C-O-L-L-I-N. And this is not a contest. I'm not looking for the best piece of artwork. I'm not looking for any of that. What I want to know is I want to see what you're learning. Show me what you are learning, it could be anything. If you're learning how to weld, maybe uh, if you're learning how to do uh, woodwork, if you're learning sculpture, if you're learning photography, if you're learning um, how to knit, if you are learning how to card make, anything, web design, anything is learning, I wanna see it. And that, uh, this, this contest is open for the Americas, right? So do you wanna talk a little bit of those logistics for the peoples? Absolutely, we're inviting everybody in North America, Canada, US and Mexico and also the rest of Latin America. Anybody yeah. watching us, please go follow Colin Chan and use the hashtag learn with Colin to show him what you're le learning, what you're, what you're doing every day to never stop learning. And welcome, we're really big on just constantly staying creative, um, drawing every day, creating every day, learning every day. And Colin is one of the people that we look to every single day for inspiration. He's going to be giving away uh, two Intuos Pros, right? Is that, is that what it is? Thanks yeah, to Annex uh, Pro. Yeah, uh, Intuos Pro Small. Intuos Pro Small. So please follow along this initiative. Uh, he will be, uh, I guess, announcing the winners this Saturday Monday. or Monday? Monday. Monday. We'll, go, we'll go Monday. We're going to do it Monday. So you guys have time to do it. Uh, like I said, make sure you tag me, use the hashtag, and definitely follow me. All right? If you ain't following, I definitely follow everybody, but you have to follow me. I'm looking at that. If you ain't following me, you ain't using the hashtag, and you ain't tagging me, I'm not going to know where to find you. All right? So I'm going to give you guys till Monday to do so. That's really cool, Colin. Thank you so much for teaching us some basics uh, of ZBrush. It's a very robust program, guys. You got to start somewhere. But uh, most people that I've talked to have learned ZBrush on their own. Colin is one of them. So go play with it this weekend and show, uh, show Colin on Instagram. You've seen Learn with Colin, hashtag what you're doing with ZBrush. This is going to be a wrap because we're already at 114. We yeah, have even now. Uh, over an hour of your time, but we are very happy that you joined us today, Colin. And thank you so much for, for teaching us something new every day. We're going to share again the slide with our promos from Annex Pro. Thank you so much to our friends at Annex Pro for helping make this uh, webinar possible. Yes, thank you to Annex Pro 100%. And to all the students watching, I think there was somebody from Annex Pro on our chat giving away their email because they can hook you up with some uh, student discount. So I hope you got that email there. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. This has been another fun session of Welcome Academy. Sorry, not Welcome Academy. Welcome <laughs> webinar. But also join Welcome Academy in September. I'll tell you more about that later. <laughs> thank you, guys. Have a great day. Thank you, Colin. You've been so fun to watch. No, thank you. You guys are awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for those watching on Facebook as well. We're going to leave the slide here with the Annex Pro specials. 
Not so far.